So thank you for coming. Thank you all members from ICFO from, uh, from, uh, for coming to, to Madrid. And um, we start with uh, this round table about how is uh, monitoring uh, around the world. Uh, we are having with us, uh, um, I'll start from Javier, uh, Javier Garcia de Confío in Mexico. Um, Harminki Close from uh, CBF uh, in the Netherlands, Martina Ziegler, uh, CEO of uh, Zivo in Switzerland, and uh, Burkhard Wilke, uh, CEO of um, DZI in Germany. Um, Javier, vamos a empezar. I'm going to begin with you, Javier, if you don't mind. We've seen the importance behind the uh, standards, the common standards, and one of them is uh, financial disclosure and transparency, and transparency behind the PL, the accounts, and everything to be disclosed on the website. When it comes to Mexico, the situation is rather different. Can you please elaborate about the situation in, in Mexico, which is uh, very important because apparently you don't adapt, you need to adapt the standards to the realities in the countries and this is what we all do in our countries. So CONFIO has adapted to the Mexican reality in order to ensure these principles are fully applicable. Well, thank you. Uh, allow me to uh, start by thanking you for inviting me and um, it is a pleasure to be here today. Yes. You rightly said it, Dana. Every single member needs to analyze uh, the standards which are applicable to the countries, and we need to review those standards or areas where such uh, standards are not fully met or applicable. Now, when it comes to Mexico, 12 years ago, we um, monitor or assess how to make these uh, financial information um, more transparent and as such because of the idiosyncratic situation in our, in our country in Mexico disclosing financial statements publicly or the, the wealth of an organization plus their assets you know their equity is a thorny issue and you know explaining who rules these uh, steering committees and the management teams could be considered as a risky business really because it is a matter of safety facing the organization facing the employees it is too sad really but we need to be understanding the situation in your country and you can really act freely in this disclosing exercise because you feel there's going to be um, um, a hinder or a negative aspect behind it. So at the end of the day, there is a growing uh, sentiment that this can really have an impact if you disclose financial information to the public, to the audiences on a public website, disclosing all such information, would be considered as a very risky thing in, in Mexico, in the Mexican reality. So what we have done though, is that to, we recommend to the organizations to um, announce, we are open to receive your questions. You as audience, you can ask any questions you want. You can request information. Can you please um, engage uh, a communication channel with the audience, with the uh, public, with a, a detailed information on how can you gain access to financial information and there to ensure the mechanisms are established in order to gain access to the, um, the uh, information. But this really uh, leaves some room for maneuver to the organization. They can really securely handle information. Um, and not every single organization, I must say, follows that road. Many of them say, okay, this is my information. I feel there is no problem whatsoever, but um, it has been challenging, I must recognize, for the um, um, uh, charities to openly say, okay, we're going to disclose the information with no problem whatsoever. We have seen some reluctant members. Yeah, but that's why it's very important for, uh, you know, monitors to adapt to the situation in the country and the reality in the country and little by little growing. 
You've been uh, this Jedi. You, 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 you haven't been 130 years, but this Jedi <laughs> have been um, was founded uh, 130 years ago. That's a long time. What's the the keys of this uh, the success for uh, monitoring uh, organization to 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 continue and to uh, the evolution and to continue with uh, with this work? And also, I know you are changing a few things on on how you see uh, the fundraising. Could you tell us about that, please? Well, um, Anna, uh, I, I think, uh, well, I can only witness 30 years of this one <laughs> 30 years, um, but uh, our predecessors uh, documented their, their, their work, and, um, and I, I think one of the lessons learned we, we can draw from the, the past uh, is that the uh, diverse structure of, of our um, governance of, of, of our in institute um, uh, has provided stability. So the, um, uh, the board of DZI, which is steering our, our work, um, it consists of uh, five re representatives of five institutions. It's uh, the German Federal Ministry of uh, Family Affairs, which is, which is also responsible for civil in engagement. It is the city uh, government of the city of Berlin and the German Association of Cities, because also the, they are interested in uh, donations and, and in uh, social uh, issues. Uh, it is the German uh, Chamber for Industry and, and Commerce, so the uh, German National As Association and the Federal uh, Association of the Welfare Organizations, like Red Cross, uh, uh, Caritas, and, and, and so on. So this is a diverse structure covering all the three sectors, uh, state, pu public sector, economy, and the civil se sector. And uh, in several um, phases of our existence, um, uh, one of those institutions was stronger engaged uh, in other um, times, other were stronger engaged, but altogether this gave stability. Also reflected in a diverse financial um, financial basis. So our budget is financed by, uh, not by one um, main uh, source, but by uh, four to five main sources, public money, but also own, own income. So I think this is one uh, of the lessons learned. The other one is that, uh, of course, we, we should develop. We should develop our methods and even our standards. Uh, not too hectically, not, not too, too quickly, but um, in a sufficient way. And at the moment, you're right, we are thinking uh, whether the, um, uh, the benchmark which we apply. So we have a strong and long tradition to calculate the administration and fundraising costs of the NGOs. We have a ceiling. We say that a maximum of 30% of the annual expenditure may be allocated to um, administration or fundraising. But we also explain to the public and to the media that fundraising and administration is important. It is positive. It is a prerequisite for competence, for, for transparency, uh, as long as it stays in, in certain limits. We have had in the past, uh, and we are still having uh, an additional benchmark uh, measuring the efficiency of fundraising and uh, compared to the fundraising income. And there, at the moment, we are thinking that we should uh, change this uh, th this point because it proved to be very uh, a very high workload for our auditing team, but also for the organisations. Mm -hmm. And in, in that phase, we are uh, possibly um, changing that that, uh, that point and and uh, doing it uh, more flexible and not, not as strict as before. But of course, the quality of the seal should not and will not uh, be damaged because of this. It's always very difficult to find this balance between uh, go as far as possible in, in the analysis, but with uh, reasonable resources for us and, of course, for, for the charities. So yes, this is it, it is, of course, you need participation in the discussion process. We should not decide it on our own. We include uh, um, the organizations, we include uh, scientists. But finally, we will decide on, on our own. It will be our board. Hmm. And uh, that's, I, I think, a, a third uh, uh, con condition for for a success is uh, our neutrality and, and in independence. So yes, finally, yes. we are deciding as an independent monitoring organization and uh, not the monitored organizations uh, can, can decide. They are uh, included in the discussion, but not in the decision. Yeah, of course. 
uh, Haminki, you changed uh, some time ago, not that long ago, to a development-oriented monitoring in order to help charities and to improve. Please tell us yeah. this change and uh, how it's been and how it's evolving. Okay. Yeah, we call it development-oriented monitoring. And that means that our monitoring contributes to um, uh, to development of the charities. So our monitoring process is meant to help uh, charities grow in professionalism. And when that happens, the sector grows in quality. And when that happens, uh, trust is um, more easy to give to the sector. Um, we are helped by the standard committee because they uh, didn't make rule-based uh, standards, but principle-based standards. So the principle is more important than exactly the letter of the, of the standard itself. The way we do, um, we try to uh, contribute to the, uh, to the growth uh, in professionalism is that we use our data. Uh, Burkhardt mentioned already that you have a lot of data about the fundraising percentage. We do have a lot of uh, data as monitoring organizations. We're not only a monitoring organization, we are also a data institute and a knowledge institute. We know a lot about the sector. And because of, uh, we have the data of, of our 680 organizations with a seal and also of 300 organizations without our seal. And so, and we validate the data, so we have a high quality of data, and that means that we can make benchmarks and that we can have research and that we can have insights um, of the sector and we give back that knowledge and insight. So an individual organization can compare itself to how the sector image is and then they can see, hey, I'm, I'm good in this, but I can improve on that. And so then they, um, and that, that's the way uh, that we try to do that. And I think more of us are doing that, yeah. yeah. Um, Martina, uh, in the case of, now I speak as Fundación Lealtad, we're just uh, um, starting with the analysis of impact, which for us is quite, uh, quite new. Uh, but you started 12 years ago in, in Zivo in Switzerland. Uh, after these 12 years, what can we expect that can happen to us? <laughs> so what can happen 10 years from now in, in this evolution of analysis of impact of uh, what charities are doing? Uh, in fact, we took uh, the model uh, you have to, to be inspired and, and to put it that in Spain. So we'd like to know how, what's going to happen. <laughs> the crystal ball. Yeah, it's, it's quite a journey, I think, you, you start. Uh, for the first uh, three or four years when we started uh, talking about impact uh, to the charities, it was more like motivate them, convince them that um, impact is important and also help and give guidance how they could start um, um, uh, evaluating impact. So we organized trainings, we, we made manuals uh, for charities to explain, to make sure we all understand the same when we talk about impact and to learn together how, how to evaluate uh, impact. And a few years later then we included the, the impact uh, topic in the standards and we started monitoring the charities according uh, how they measure impact, not not uh, if their impact is enough high. We wanted to understand how do they plan their project and how do they evaluate the project and what conclusions are they drawing from the results. And um, now we gave to all the charities who have our seal, we assessed them, we monitored them and we gave them feedback um, to tell them uh, whether we think they're uh, doing it well or whether we think they could improve in monitoring impact. And what we see like 10 or 12 years after we started, um, we see now, um, that's why I say it's a little bit of a journey, we are not um, at the end of, of this journey. Um, we see three groups uh, of charities, one group, and it's not the biggest one, unfortunately, is the group. They are very motivated by themselves for the impact topic. Um, they, they even did impact assessments before we asked them to do it because their board, their management, their project managers, they all knew it's important for their work. And they not only do it correctly, they also really take 
learnings out of, of the findings and they introduce it in institutional learning and develop their organizations oriented on impact. But it's not the biggest group. We have a second group. Um, they are also doing impact assessments, but they are maybe a little bit more also motivated because it's asked from others, from donors, from institutional donors, from governments who, who want to see impact assessments if they give money for a project. Um, there we see also progresses because they really implemented impact assessments. Uh, but sometimes, uh, maybe there we have a little bit of a luck, they do it more to show that they do it and maybe it's not so much integrated in decision making or in planning of new projects. It's more like um, they have to do it because they are asked to do it. Yeah. And then we have a third group and unfortunately it's not the smallest one, <laughs> uh, which uh, are, is still a little bit struggling with, with the topic because maybe they are not so much forced to do it uh, because they are also smaller, uh, they don't have a lot of resources, they think it's a complicated topic and they are still struggling struggling a little bit with quality management, with output, they, they are measuring output but talk about impact, which is something different. And there I think that's very focused now and we think this group should be a little bit more, get a little bit more help also from us and we try to come up with a tool, uh, let's say semi-intelligent tool uh, to help them um, because they have knowledge in their organization, but they have not formalized it and maybe they don't even know it. Yeah. So we would like to give them some, some um, assistance in, with a question guided tool um, about impact so that they, can, then, that they can come up with an impact model and make it more easier for them to, to plan their projects uh, impact oriented. But they have to do it themselves <laughs> at the end and they have to be convinced themselves. At That's the end. a challenging standard anyway. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> take you a little bit time for but this standard. Yeah, it's to mark yeah. the path and, and yeah. to, to see where we should go and, uh, and to go. Yeah, yeah, we clearly could see a, a development uh, of the sector and of the charities, but they have different starting points and uh, different, different issues in their organizations. Yeah. Thank you. Javier. You have been working for 12 years in Confio. Um, 10 years after your foundation, you made an evaluation of the uh, development of the organizations in Mexico since you were born. What were your main conclusions and what are the next steps? Because now you are about to implement the SEAL. You started with uh, certain organizations and now you are going to introduce the SEAL model. What, what are you exactly in this journey? Well, first of all, I would like to say that the main uh, reflection, and I, I also see uh, from the speakers in this panel, uh, is that everything is in a continuous evolution. And in this evolution, in Mexico, we have a saying, I don't know if you use it also here, is that we, we make the, the path as we walk. And so we are innovating. We are treading into a direction that others have not dared to uh, to try and we need to instill um, trust in our organizations um, 10 years ago 12 years ago um, Confio started working in Mexico with this model and uh, after these 10 years what we have learned is that there are certain simpler situations uh, uh, things that you can correct more easily within the organizations uh, we can talk about the internal processes, for instance, certain communication elements or certain, uh, certain elements related to the compliance with uh, the regulations, for instance. However, there are other elements that are not so easy to push or to change. Uh, when it comes to the indicators that we take into account, uh, I'm referring, for instance, to the steering uh, bodies, it's not easy for an organization to restructure or to make the steering committees more active. 
So, the model, or what we have learned, is that the model needs to be based on the support from the donors. They have a powerful voice and they are very open to the donor's voice and they, they are the ones that mark the path for the organization. So our models need to be in line with uh, donor sector that is very aware, that is uh, based on the principles, on the standards that we aim to have and to live by. So among these findings, this is what I can highlight. We have been working for 10 years, but the sector uh, is, is hard uh, to change, especially when it comes to the steering uh, bodies. Also, as you have said, we are starting a new phase, a second phase, as to where we want the sector to be headed to. We want to speak with the organizations and with the donors in this sense, and we are also implementing a seal and a certain uh, approval mark. We hadn't dared to say that uh, an organization was accredited, was certified, but seeing what the organizations are saying, um, if we can really confirm that the organizations are complying with what they say they do, well, I think we can really call this a certification. We are doing an in-depth work with the organization and we want these organizations that are in the first phase or in a very advanced phase to uh, have a goal for themselves that goes beyond the certification. So we will have the two phases coexisting, the say the basic phase, the, the preliminary phase, and uh, at the same time we want organizations to see that they can achieve um, a certification seal. In this way, the organization will be able to uh, convey the process that they are going through and also the donors can be also incorporated to these uh, boosting process in order to obtain this seal. They will be the ones to give us feedback through the um, selection processes, the feedback processes, so that organizations can be more careful uh, about certain aspects that we want to push. Well, uh, I wish you luck with the implementation of the UNO model. You have something that uh, some other countries share, but it's not usual from uh, from uh, ICFO members, which is the, the blacklist, the non-eligible uh, uh, charities, the not recommended charities. Um, apart from how does it work, uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I think it's interesting to know, this list, does it increase or reduce trust? Because you could see it in, in both ways. Uh, at the end you say, okay, maybe charities are not doing well, but in the other sense you say, no, but, but I know which one are not. So um, how, how, how is it working in the society, the impact of having this list? And also, uh, if uh, the medias are using uh, this information or don't, don't look at it, or how, how it's going, if it's, um, if we talk more about the bad than the good, <laughs> I would okay. say. Well, I very much liked the, 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 the image of which Salvador uh, uh, painted uh, of, of the dentist this, this morning. So in this <laughs> sense, of course, a dentist is, is a necessary uh, person. And um, so uh, if, if a dentist only polishes the, the, the good teeth, um, then uh, it's, it's not sustainable and not enough for, for the whole uh, mouth for oh. the whole sector. Also. So, um, but is, this is only one part of the, of the answer. I think uh, another part of the answer is um, uh, what I said in my, my first question that it is, this is also part of a development and also part of, of uh, this kind of, of system which uh, Javier described that um, uh, it, it, it is better to have uh, several steps of donor information than, than only maybe one instrument. So, 
our donor advisory service, um, when it started 130 years before, it started with telling what are the good apples and what are the bad apples. Okay. So uh, we have a long tradition in, in, doing, in doing this. Um, uh, it's, it's also uh, uh, part of our, our profile, our DNA, uh, that, that we uh, see ourselves as an independent donor advisory and donor protection center. So in, to a certain extent, we are part of con consumer pr protection uh, uh, sector. And um, so uh, in, for, for many years, we, we did also publish, uh, or since all of, all of our existence, we published negative uh, uh, as well as positive ju judgments. And the seal of approval then, now 30 years ago, was a new instrument specially um, emphasizing on and focusing on the very good ones and on those who voluntarily, and the application process is voluntary, the initiative comes from the NGOs who apply for the seal, who voluntarily want to ob obey to a, a very high l a level. But nevertheless, there are many uh, other organizations, and uh, so uh, as, as long as we receive um, a significant amount of donor questions, donor requests to certain organizations, even if they don't have our seal, we will address those organizations and ask them to send us um, several basic information like financial report, like registration, like fundraising material to produce such a judgment. It can be negative, it can be put them on the blacklist, but it can also be neutral. Um, and even the neutral uh, estimations on non-seal organizations are published on our website. And um, so uh, the, the seal was, as a positive instrument, very uh, successful. And in that time, we uh, a little bit uh, lost the concentration on the blacklist. But then we did a workshop with nonprofit organizations. Um, I think it was in uh, 2008, 2009. And they strongly asked us and recommended us to uh, come back to also the blacklist because they, they knew that uh, there are bad apples in their family and uh, they really appreciate that an independent institution like DZI helps them and helps uh, the public to detect those, those uh, mm -hmm. bad apples. Maybe to add a third one, we also have a third beside of the SEAL and the evalu evaluated non-SEAL information. We are part of a so-called um, Initiative Transparent Civil Society, and it is a joint initiative um, together with Transparency International Germany, together with main umbrella bodies, and even the consumer pr protection agencies in Germany. And we have um, uh, formulated 10 minimum information which should be published on the website of all charities. And uh, now I think uh, roughly uh, 2,000 uh, charities in Germany have this very basic transparency level, which is not a seal, which is not an evaluation, but which is the, the third and basic level even of our activity uh, to, to promote tr transparency. Mm, not to have minimums at least, yeah. that clear. Um, yeah, another issue uh, that it's not usual, but it can happen, management salaries. If when management salaries are too high, uh, that can be a problem and it's also difficult to change if it's already done. So I know, Martina, that uh, in Zivo you've uh, created a big study with a, and you have on your website a calculator giving ideas of what's a reasonable range of, uh, of uh, management salaries. Please tell us, because it's <laughs> very new for us. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, um, it's a difficult topic and a sensitive topic, because um, uh, salaries um, um, for NGOs, um, the, um, um, there is a gap between what uh, the public is expecting, a salary or a decent salary or a, a, a good salary uh, for an NGO, um, is accepted, what the public is accepting, and what the market or what, what is, is, is necessary to pay if you want to have qualified employees which are needed because charities get more and more professional, they have higher demands, they have to, to respond to, and usually, in, at least in Switzerland, uh, at the operational level, they, pay, they work with paid staff. 
Um, so we think um, when it, and then especially um, the focus is on on the salary of the top uh, level of the director or maybe also of presidents uh, if they if they get paid. Um, and uh, we think it's a reputational issue or risk for the sector if we do not look at the salaries. Um, and we think um, just to make them publish would only encourage to do rankings, which we do not like, as you mentioned in your presentation. So we decided um, to, to include it in our standards and to monitor um, the top salaries only. We focus only on the top salaries uh, of the NGOs. And therefore, we do a benchmark study every five years. We collect data from the monitor charities. We analyze the data together with a university who is specialized on NGOs and they do uh, like a statistical model with regression analysis um, to identify indicators which explain um, the, the, the level of a, of a salary. So for a specific case they create a calculator and for a specific case we can predict what would be the expected salary in this for this organization and this person. About 10 indicators we need to know for, for the CEO salary. And this estimated salary is uh, like the, the starting point for our monitoring. Um, we, we have then a range. Of course, it's not like we say this is exactly the salary you have to pay, but it's, it's a starting point for the discussion with the NGO. And, and if we see they are much above, uh, like like 30 percent or more above, then we would really talk to them and say it's too high and it's a risk for the sector. You have to change something. If they're only a little bit higher, then we give them a feedback and it helps them to see where they stand. But the problem we had with this approach was that we were always too late because they had already uh, signed the contract, they had already employed the person and then we came and had a tough discussion and uh, did not make many friends. And we also lost some charities, of course. <laughs> um, and that, that's why now uh, we started to, to promote this calculator to the charities, not only use it for monitoring, but open it uh, for the charities to use them it uh, in advance because we want to uh, encourage them to before they employ or they look for new people that they uh, have an idea what would be a, a reasonable range uh, for a salary and that they can negotiate a salary which would be also accepted by the sector and 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 um, not give a problem for the sector but it's it's not a huge uh, topic. It's just a focus topic with a few charities uh, which are maybe not familiar with the sector or have, yeah, have other ideas. No, of course it's not a general problem. It's, yeah. But it's something but that when it arises you need to have find a solution. Yeah, so. and it's always, you, our president has to participate in the discussion, the whole board is involved and uh, it's, yeah. it's not a pleasant one, but no. it's, a necessary it's not an easy one, one yeah. anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and Harminki CBF is, is doing, is planning and is working on, on the possibility of extending the analysis not only to charities as it's already doing, but also to crowdfunding uh, platforms and maybe to social enterprises. So uh, that's, that's quite new for all of us that we are focused <laughs> on charities. Yeah. Um, please yeah. uh, tell us uh, the plans and the possibilities you are studying on, on that subject. Yes, well, I know I only have four minutes and we have a big clock over there. <laughs> <laughs> and I can talk about these developments very long <laughs> because, so I'll try to make it short. But yes, we see changes in the field of philanthropy. I think we all see it. And uh, we see it in the ways people give to uh, charities. We also see uh, changes um, or the focus on impact. We heard about it uh, already. And um, when you look at the changes in giving, then crowdfunding platforms are one of them. Uh, and uh, well, we 
we had a scandal in the Netherlands with one of the crowdfunding platforms, uh, I think two or three years ago. Um, the platform went bankrupt, and the money given by the many donors to the many askers on that platform was gone. And of course, people were very angry. And um, quite some crowdfunding platforms wanted to show that they are trustworthy. So they came to us and they said, well, can we also have a seal? Can we also show that we are uh, to be trusted? And um, within our own structure of our recognition system, as we call it, uh, we have the charities, we have the standard committee, and we have ourselves, we also uh, noticed that this scandal was influencing the way people looked at uh, charities as well. It was also uh, challenging the reputation of charities. And so also within the group of charities and the recognition system, we um, realized that it would be good to look into this. And so we started that process, I think, almost two years ago, or more than two years ago. We didn't finish it yet, almost, we are almost there, because there are some um, challenges to take. Um, there are some risks that are different. One of the risks that is different is that um, we are going to monitor the platform, not all the askers. So um, you need to uh, be able to trust that the asker asking for money is going to do with the money that he says he's doing. And how can you uh, mitigate those risks? And um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge. I think we, um, we've, uh, we found a solution. We, in the Netherlands, we as, as a monitoring organization, we don't set standards. We have an independent, separate committee who is set, setting the standards. So we work very closely together to see how we can solve the problems um, that uh, we, we see. So I can talk about that much more. If you find it interesting, please come to me. I can, sh I can share more. Um, the other um, developments we see is that we uh, see uh, that philanthropy charities are becoming more entrepreneurial and that companies are becoming more social responsible. And those two trends are moving towards each other and somewhere they meet. And we see already a lot of social enterprises with impact first the profit they make go back to the uh, purpose they have. And the purpose is building a better world in one way or the other. So um, when that happens, we have to ask ourselves the question, where do we draw that line? And what does that mean for the traditional charities? What does it mean for a monitoring system? What does it mean for a standard setting? So that we, we are looking into that. I think monitoring social enterprises would be step three or four. But asking ourselves now the question what this means for monitoring charities who are becoming more entrepreneurial is a question I think we should ask ourselves right now. So that's why we started. Thank you, interesting. Um, I'll, I'll ask all of you a headline of how you see charities in your countries, very different countries, so just a headline that we could have about, uh, about that. Javier, let's go in this order, if you want. Bueno, in, in the, the Mexican uh, situation, well, the, this industry is growing. The strengthening of good practices is uh, booming. Um, the willingness to be uh, seen as a uh, trustworthy and um, it is you know ensuring these you know daily collaborations are forged from all the interested stake parties this is basically the panorama in, um, in Mexico CDF well my sentence would be a sentence of hope and not only about the charities in the Netherlands but what I see is that in a world where there is a lot of distrust we as monitoring organizations are raising trust and in a world of war, in a world of economic crisis, in a world of climate challenges, charities and their supporters don't only dream of a better world, they are building it. Martina? Um, charities in Switzerland, um, they uh, have a lot of trust from donors because donors give 80% of the household, 70% of the of the people give regularly to charities and they give more and more. Last year we had like more donations uh, than ever. So 
they are seen as a very relevant um, players or actors uh, and they earn trust and uh, we hope with our work to to contribute that this trust will will stay and charities are further developing in a professional way well in, in germany um, in a narrow sense it's a challenge for the charities to um, to uh, fight against the dropping percentage of people donating money. So this percentage is, is, is dropping because of several reasons. And fight maybe is not, uh, is not the, the right word, but they, they should uh, really uh, meet this, this, this challenge and find new ways to communicate to, uh, to donors. Also to do more collaboration among each others. That's an, another point. In a broader sense, civil society, if you see it, um, is not only the, the good ones. In, in Germany, we see uh, an, an increasing number of civil society movements which are bad for the society. Yeah? So populist movements, e extremist uh, movements, and it will cause additional uh, activities uh, for the society, but also for us and for the, the, uh, the charity world to um, uh, divide and to detect those organizations who could be very uh, bad and, and, and painful to a society, um, uh, be it on the right wing or on the left wing. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Maria Eugenia? Phenomenal. Pero muchísimas gracias. Ha sido muy it has been most interesting, and I do have a couple of questions being raised by the members in this uh, room, but there's more, but I'm going to cluster them. They have asked uh, about social enterprises, and I believe we can discuss this over the coffee break. Organizations in those countries where there are no monitoring institutions, what are the assessments? What are what, what is the advice that you can give them if there is an, an, a monitoring organization? And what is the support that you can give to these um, uh, organizations that want to engage in that? And th what about the principle oriented stand, uh, standards, uh, Herminki? Can you elaborate a little bit on those uh, standards? I'll take the first one, if you don't mind, and then I'll hand over the floor to Hamenki. As for the first question, I'll switch to English. If uh, if a country want uh, an organisation want to start uh, working on on monitoring, um, they of course in in ICFO we are glad to to give support on that. Um, the support will never be economic support. <laughs> this is important to know. But uh, we we help. We explain the model. We give guidelines. And uh, for example, last year uh, Burkina Faso entered in in ICFO. Uh, in this entrance, they are not still. They are working on how to start monitoring, but they are still not monitoring. What we do with them is uh, we organize uh, some meetings with uh, different members, explaining how each one of us work, so they can decide which model uh, works better for them, and also take ideas and create their own model inspired by all of us. So this is what ICFO is doing. ICFO is always helping and very happy to help. Um, anyone that would like to start uh, monitoring in, in, uh, in, in his country and uh, depending the way, but always with, uh, with uh, know-how. And uh, for the other question? Yeah, and I missed the first ones, but I, the question you want me to respond to is about the principle-based uh, yes. uh, standards. Yes, well, a principle-based stand standard is a standard that is about the principle behind it, so you really have to understand what is meant by the standard. A rule-based standard is telling you exactly what you have to do. What you see often with rule-based standards, so an example of that would be the 30% or the 25% we had in the Netherlands that you are not allowed to spend more on fundraising than 25% of what, it, um, what the revenue is out of uh, fundraising. But that one is a rule-based uh, standard. And what we saw was that uh, charities were working around it. They were very good at working around it. Um, now we have uh, a principle-based uh, standard, which means that charities have to uh, show that they spend as much money as they can to realize their mission. 
and um, well, and they have to be transparent about it. And of course, we have our benchmark, so we we can tell an organization you are far below the benchmark. Why is it? And often they have a very good reason. So they can have a reason. We are saving money because we, in two three years from now, we want to do a big project and we don't have the money unless we save money. And then you have a few years that you spend less on the on the mission, but that you're saving money to do a lot for the mission two three years later, which is of course the ultimate purpose, isn't it? So. Um, it sounds sometimes easier, principle-based standards, but principle-based standards are much more difficult to live up to than rule-based standards. Yeah. I hope that makes it a I little think bit it's more. pretty clear. And yeah, uh, yeah I think it's, uh, that's the complexity of our work. Uh, to understand, does it make sense? Yeah. Even if maybe the numbers are not that good, does it make sense? It makes sense. So yeah. it's fine. Yeah. That's so, why it's so uh, important to talk to each other, to really uh, not only look at, at reports, but also have that conversation with each other. Yeah. Okay. Perfecto. We run out of time. So. Sí. Muchísimas gracias.